Okay, so I, I've bombarded you with uh, a lot of uh, actually empirical evidence and somewhat less with the theoretical structures, but you by now have a reasonably good idea what we are talking about, and I assume that many of you had some course in international trade. So the question that I want to start the discussion now is the following. If we, could, if we can do as much as we did uh, with uh, the traditional frameworks, why do we need to look for something else? So the issue is uh, the following, that there are some very uncomfortable features of the neoclassical trade theory that I've presented to you. And uh, in the late 70s and early 80s, these features uh, were flagged essentially. And people started to think uh, how to overcome the constraints that they impose on our ability to uh, analyze foreign trade and foreign direct investment. So one feature is that if you think in the Ricardian terms or Heckscher Lean terms, then the drivers of trade are essentially differences across countries. The countries have to be different in order to trade with each other. If they are very similar, there is no incentive to trade. On the other hand, as I showed you in the data, there is a lot of trade among countries which look quite similar. The rich countries trade mostly with rich countries. And the poorer countries trade with the rich countries much less, proportionately speaking, than the rich countries trade with the rich countries. So this was one I issue. Another issue was brought up by Gruber and Lloyd, who published in 1974 a book in which they collected a lot of data and they pointed out the following, that if you look at trade, then unlike a Heckscher lean type environment or a Ricardian environment, what you see is a lot of trade within industries rather than across industries. So you, if you think in Ricardian or, or actually in, or in terms, the idea is that you export in one industry, you import some other industry. But you don't expect within the same industry to be importing and exporting. And what they showed in these data is that there is a lot of trade within industries. So in the chemical industry, France exports chemical to chemicals to, say, Italy, and Italy exports chemicals to France. And you go industry by industry, and you see this. Of course, this varies across industries; it's not the same. And they developed an index, which is known as the Grubeloid Index, which measures what's known as the share of intra-industry trade. So, so essentially, you look at the overlapping flows, and you ask the question how much overlapping there is in trade as compared to the total volume of trade. And then you can see to what extent there is intra-industry tra trade versus intersectoral trade. And they showed that in many countries, the share of intra-industry trade is of the order of 70%, which is quite large. The other thing is that it's very hard to predict bilateral trade flows in uh, these type of environments. So if you are interested only what does a country export and what does it import, it's relatively easier to do than ask the question, uh, how much does Germany trade with Italy versus how much does it trade with Japan or the US or Canada or some other country. These bilateral trade flows for which we have very detailed data are very important, and it's very hard to explain them with this, ty this type of uh, approaches. So Jan Tinbergen who is a, was a Dutch economist. He published a famous book in 1962 in which he proposed to explain trade flows at the country level with uh, bilateral trade flows with what's known as the gravity equation. So this is a sort of parallel to the gravity equation in physics. In economics, the idea is that the volume of trade between two countries is proportional to the product of their GDP levels. And there is some factor 
which uh, he called the trade resistance measure that may raise or reduce the fraction that you get from this type of specification. And Tinbergen estimated a gravity equation uh, in a very sort of successful way. And then people used gravity equations, uh, I would say, almost infinitely many times on different data sets, different countries, different periods. And it always explain, um, explains quite well the data. So the question is, how come that the gravity equation works and you cannot really use uh, the neoclassical approaches to generate a gravity equation. At least you cannot do it in a simple and transparent way. Yes. The, the other thing which was sort of less noted but became prominent uh, much later is that there are aspects of trade liberalization that were noted by Bella Balassa, who was a professor at Johns Hopkins uh, University. And what Balassa noted was the following. Uh, when the European Customs Union that preceded the EU formed in 1957, after several years, Balassa tried to understand uh, how the, ha, has this union evolved, you know, how the, uh, did it affect trade, and so on. And what he found, to his great surprise, was that a lot of the adjustment to the formation of this custom union was across firms within industries rather than across sectors. And he puzzled over it because you know, he was trained in neoclassical trade theory, and there the adjustment has to be across sectors. And across sectors, there was some adjustment, but the great majority was in, within industries. So in a way, I, I really think about him as a sort of predecessor to monopolistic competition in foreign trade, although he has never developed a proper model and so on. But if you read what he wrote, then his wording is uh, pretty close to what happened later, yes. Uh, the last point is that within these frameworks, it's very hard to think about multinational corporations. And ma multinational corporations have become dominant players in world trade. Now, why is it hard to think about multinational corporations? Because when you think about a neoclassical environment, there are really no firms there. You can think about outputs of industries, inputs of industries, but you don't identify anything about the specific firms. Firms are uh, sort of in the background. But if you talk about multinationals, you have to define the firm. You have to define its activities. You have to identify why does it choose to do some activities at home and other activities in a foreign country. So it just was unsuitable for this. And the role of multinationals in trade has expanded uh, tremendously. Uh, today, about one third of world trade takes place within the boundaries of firms, namely not across firms. This wasn't as big at the time, one but third. one third, yeah. But it was big enough. OK. I don't know at which data you, lo you, you, lo you, you are looking at, because there are data sets in which the, this is fully identified. So in the US, the Bureau of Economic Analysis has detailed data about firms. And they publish numbers uh, under different definitions. So for example, uh, 
if a subsidiary, a foreign subsidiary, is owned by an American firm and the fraction of ownership is only 10%, they would define it as a subsidiary of this particular parent. Now, this is really not satisfactory. They do also publish what they call majority owned foreign subsidiaries. And people who, you know, who study multinational, they use basically this definition. So you know for every American parent all its subsidiaries under this definition. And uh, there's a lot of information. Not everything that we want, all right? We always want more. But for many purposes, it's good enough. And this is also true in some other countries. I know that uh, you know, Sweden has very good data on multinationals in some other countries. So there might be countries in which it's hard to identify subsidiaries of multinationals, but uh, for a fair number of countries, it's not so difficult. It depends on the outlet. If it's uh, owned by McDonald's, it will be considered to be intra-industry trade, intra in intra-firm trade. Yes. And, and, and but if it's not owned, then you know there are McDonald's who are not owned by McDonald's. The McDonald only provides a license to run them, so th this will not be counted. <coughs> Yes, it will be considered intra-firm trade. And, and, there, and, and we know what the numbers are. It's not I don't know. The Bureau of Economic <laughs> Analysis knows. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I they collect this data. I mean, I would have thought that a, a company might want to keep information like that private. I don't, well, you, yeah. The information is private in the sense that these, all these data sets are confidential. So the Bureau of Economic Analysis publishes uh, uh, sectoral data and so on, which, for which there's free access. Mm -hmm. But if you want access to firm level data, it's a similar like in, in the census. You need, uh, it's even worse with the BEA, you need a license. And you are lucky because you are an American, you can get the license. But if you are not American, you just cannot get the license to work with them, with these data. I think it's actually more complicated, yes. But yes, it's, uh, yeah, there, there is detailed data for, for many countries, actually. Yeah. OK. so. This dissatisfaction led to what's known as the monopolistic competition uh, revolution in trade uh, in, the 1990s, in the 1980s. And uh, the original insight of model building for this purpose goes back to Edward Chamberlain, who was a professor at Harvard. In 1933, he published his book on monopolistic competition. Uh, unfortunately for John Robinson, who was at the University of Cambridge and published at the same year a similar book, his proved to be, at least the profession thought, much more insightful. And so his approach essentially has been dominating the, the field. Now his book doesn't have a technical model. Uh, you know, the, the analysis is sort of uh, some figures, uh, a lot of words, but it's very clever. And the main ideas are there. And the idea is the following. Think about a sector. And then in this sector, not all, not all goods are perfect substitutes for each other. I mean, this is the key 
starting point. So if you buy a shirt uh, from one producer, it's not a perfect substitute for a shirt from another producer. So this is the idea of product differentiation. And then Chamberlain said what's happening if goods are not perfect substitutes for each other within a sector, then each manufacturer has some monopoly power. This monopoly power is limited by how many good substitutes there are in the industry. But he's facing a downward sloping demand curve. So as a result, pr the pricing is monopoly pricing. You price the good above marginal cost. And then he distinguished between two approaches, one which uh, he called the small group case and the other the large group case. So the small group case is a case of a given, a given number of firms. And the large group case is a case in which the firms are small enough so there, there is free entry. And the free entry brings down profits down to zero, which typically we interpret that the entry cost uh, equals the operating profits. So this was his idea. And you can summarize it in this type of figure in an equilibrium of the industry with free entry. You have some demand function, and you have an average cost function. And what's important here is that you can allow economies of scale at the firm level. And in the equilibrium in which marginal cost equal marginal revenue, which is the pricing equation, and average cost equal average revenue, revenue, which is the free entry equilibrium, they lead to an outcome like this. So this is a sort of one figure summary of the main idea uh, from Chamber. And so this, this idea was elaborated on in a variety of studies. And we have today very sophisticated models of monopolistic competition. Uh, it started in trade, but it uh, spilled over to other area of economics. So they have become, for example, popular in macroeconomics, in economic geography, in economic growth. When you think about uh, endogenous growth models, they, they build on, on this. So there's a lot of work in economics which departed from the neoclassical approach and adopted monopolistic competition, essentially a la Chamberlain in, in one way or, or another. Now, one should bear in mind that when one introduces sectors with monopolistic competition, one doesn't have to and one shouldn't abandon what we have learned from neoclassical growth theory, uh, <laughs> neoclassical trade theory, yes? So you can still have factor proportion effects. You can still have sectoral productivity effects. And on top of this, have a monopolistic competition. So it, it, this provides an additional building block that helps you to expand uh, your toolkit. But all of this was motivated by the observations that I said before. And then the question is, how does this approach help you understand the features of the data that I mentioned, which are, which are, are hard to explain with neoclassical uh, trade theory. So one key element is uh, this question, where do we get this downward sloping demand curve, yes, when there is product differentiation? <coughs> so at the end of the 70s, uh, there was a movement in industrial organization uh, towards more theory. If you look at the history of this field, uh, since Bain in the 1950s, it has become a very empirical field. Didn't have much theory. Then in the late 70s, theory started to be introduced. Mike Spence, he got his Nobel Prize for, sc for uh, screening, signaling, but uh, he actually had models of, uh, uh, of I.O. at the time. And Lancaster, in the book that I mentioned before, had a very expanded uh, discussion uh, of this. So th uh, there was, a, there was a, a very influential paper at the time by Salop. So all of these scholars provided approaches to product differentiation that generate this downward sloping demand curve using somewhat different mechanisms. 
So I'm not going to dwell on this mechanism because uh, we don't have much time. And in particular, what happened was that this very famous paper by Dixit and Stiglitz in 1977 proposed a very simple framework. I mean, they actually proposed something richer, but what remained in our memory is this CES structure, constant elasticity of substitution dem uh, demand, uh, demand uh, systems. And uh, in terms of the history of economic thought, the interesting thing is that although during that period, IO and trade were very similar in their approaches, they diverged, I would say, almost completely over the years. And how did they diverge? Uh, in trade, the CS function became the dominant tool. And in, CEO, they re in IO, they refused to accept this. And so they developed an alternative approach which combined Lancaster, not exactly this formulation of his. He had a paper in 1965 in which he developed a theory of demand based on characteristics. And the idea there was that people are interested in characteristics and they combine goods with different characteristics in order to satisfy their desire for these characteristics. So in I.O. they went in this direction and combined it with McFadden's discrete choice. And then Barry, Levinson, and Peik has developed a, a demand system which essentially dominates a, a industrial organization. And in trade, the field moved to CES. In, in recent times, there is, a, I don't know how to call it, uh, there is dissatisfaction with the CS, and there is now much more work which tries to move away to, uh, from it to systems in which the elasticity of demand is essentially not constant. So we'll come to this at the very end of my talk today. Okay, so to get some sense of how this type of approach hel helps you to explain some of the features that I indicated before, let's look at a very simple setup. Um, I'm building on Krugman's 1980 paper here. So you have one sector, one input, identical C as preferences, marginal cost A. So this is the cost per unit and a fixed cost F. And this is all in terms of labor, OK? And, uh, there is free entry into this industry, and this drives uh, profits to zero. So what are the implications of this? One implication is that you can compute the equilibrium number of firms in country K, say. And this depends on the size of its labor force, divided by the elasticity of substitution across products, which is also the demand elasticity and the fixed cost. So you get a very simple closed form solution from this simple general equilibrium of the number of firms in equilibrium. And what you see is that the number of firms is proportional to the size of the country. And it's negatively affected by the fixed cost and the elasticity of substitution. The other thing that you get here is that if you open this type of country to trade, then the number of products that it produces doesn't change. Well, assuming that all the countries have the same technology, like in a Heckscher Lean framework, yes? And then what happens is that every country specializes in diff different varieties of the good. If there are no trade costs, then there's going to be factor price equalization, namely the wage rate will be the same in every country. And every country will export a share of its, its varieties and import a share of every other variety. So consumers will now have access to a bigger assortment of the varieties. And they will consume more types of goods, lower quantities, of, obviously, of each. But because CS preference has this property of what we call love of variety, this is going to lead to gains from trade. Uh, if you introduce trade costs, 
then wages are not uh, equalized. The uh, bigger countries end up with higher wages. So then it's better to live in a bigger country and your real income is higher. You have a higher wage. And also you have, uh, even if you consume the same number of varieties, the proportion for which you pay lower prices is higher because you are a big country and you don't pay transport costs for domestic goods. So it's sort of nice, intuitive, and it immediately tells you, hey, there's intra-industry trade. Here, there's one sector, so there is no intersectoral trade. So all of trade is intra-industry, 100% intra-industry trade. So now you can see immediately, if we generalize it and build several sectors with different features, we'll have intra-industry trade and we'll have intersectoral trade. So this will be consistent with what Grubel and Lloyd told us. So th this is good. And then the question, what else can we do? We can get easily a gravity equation here. Why is this? This take an extreme form. Suppose there are two countries. They are exactly the same. Each one is producing 100 uh, types of products. So. Country A consumes half of country B's products, and B consumes half of country A's product. So you look at the trade volume, and the trade volume is proportional to the product of their GDP. It's straightforward. So now again, you complicate the model, you get all sorts of other effects, but you still have a grain of the gravity equation. OK, so this gives you straight intuition. So you can now extend this. Yeah. So you've been interpreting this model as there being one sector and there are different varieties of goods within that sector. Uh, what were, what's wrong with interpreting the model as there are Yeah, it's fine. In, in, in that case, there's really no difference between well, intra-industry and inter-industry. Yes. Uh, uh, so th the issue is that if there are different types of goods, it's hard to think that the elasticity of substitution across them will be the same. Yes. So you, you want to think about different goods with different elasticities of substitution. And then you have to start to think. If you don't want to think about sectors, you have to think about uh, you know, uh, groups of products which are more similar or less similar. So th then it comes pretty close to having a multi-sector structure. And this is uh, you know, what, what has happened. People started to, start to build uh, multi-sector structures. And then the way typically you think about it is that the product from the car industry is uh, less substitutable from a product from the carpet industry than another product in the car industry, yes. So this is the idea. You have goods which belong to the same industry. They, their substitutability is bigger than with goods in some other industries. So the, this is how it has been structured. So the, this has been extended to multi-sectors, introduced trade costs. And you can generate a variation in bilateral trade volumes using this approach. And the share of intra-industry trade, you can test it empirically, at least the correlations that the theoretical models uh, predict. And, and the, the, these sort of things have been done. The other thing that the da it does is you extend this model, and it provides an underpinning for a rich gravity equation. So I said that uh, Tinbergen originally, he wrote down a gravity equation, and he added to it what he called a trade resistance measure. And he just sort of arbitrarily said, look, trade resistance depends on all sorts of things, and I'm going to toss them into the regressions that I run. <coughs> 
If you do it this way, it's going to tell you exactly how the trade resistant measure looks like. And it turns out that it's highly nonlinear, for example. And this means that if you are going to estimate the effects of tariffs, transport costs, other trade impediments, then you have to estimate it in a particular way, because otherwise you'll get very biased uh, results. I'll come back to it uh, later. So to illustrate how it works, uh, Romalis, who is an Australian economist in his uh, job market paper, uh, what he did was he extended a Heckscher-Olin type model that was uh, theoretically written down also by Dornbusch, Fisher, and Samuelson. So after they wrote down the Ricardian model, they wrote another model, which is Heckscher-Olin, with a continuum of product, capital and labor, and they derived various predictions from this model. Now what he did was he topped it off with product differentiation. And product differentiation generated a particular configurations of, of trade. And he predicted and conferred, confirmed empirically that countries capture relatively larger market shares of commodities that use more intensively uh, their abundant factors of production. So you get intra-industry trade, but you also get the bias in trade structure, which is of the factor proportion uh, type. It also helps to explain a phenomena that people didn't pay attention uh, at the time. And this is the following. If you look across countries, then when you move from a poorer country to a richer country, there is an impact of trade which has to do with the volume per product and also with the number of products that you trade. In other words, there is an intensive margin of trade and there is an ex extensive margin of trade. And in this paper by Hamels and Klino, they reported that if you look at variation across countries, about 60% of the variation is due to the extensive margin rather than intensive margin. So if you have a model where you don't have products, you just have industries, obviously you cannot explain this type of phenomena. But once you move into products, in this case differentiated product, you can ask the question, can we explain this variation in the number of products that country tr countries trade in addition to the uh, intensive margin? So Broda and Weinstein, for example, they studied the US. They estimated uh, thousands of elasticities of substitution. Uh, uh, and they showed that in the US over a period of, uh, if I remember correctly, 15 years, about 2.6% uh, of GDP was gained due to expansion of the number of products that the US imported. So this extensive margin played a significant role in the US gains uh, from trade in this case. And then this was taken up in order to deal with multinational corporations. I did a couple of papers uh, on what we call vertical multinationals. Jim Markle then did a paper on what we call horizontal multinationals. But I don't have time to talk too much about multinationals. The difference is that horizontal multinationals are multinationals in which uh, if you are a parent firm, you acquire a subsidiary in a foreign country, and what you do with the subsidiary is it produces the same products that you produce at home, and it uses the product in order to sell the destination market. So this is a, a pure horizontal version. And the vertical version is you are a multinational, you acquire a subsidiary in Taiwan, and the subsidiary in Taiwan produces an intermediate input that you need and then you import the intermediate inputs in, in order to produce your final good. This is a, a pure version of vertical uh, multinational. And of course, multinationals have a mix of vertical and uh, horizontal. Okay. <coughs>
So this helped to think about multinationals uh, as well. So the, this first generation of models of monopolistic competition had one, has, well, has more than one feature, but one feature that was disturbing uh, later on was the fact that it features universal exporting. At least if you have trade costs which are proportional to the value of the product, then whatever products you produce, you sell them domestically and you also export them. There are, there's no barrier to selling it. Of course, your marginal profit will be lower if the demand in the foreign country is similar to the domestic country, but you'll still make positive profit because you can mark up price. So you have a positive profit margin on every unit that you sell. So this was a sort of uh, disturbing. And in the 1990s, new data sets became available. And what we learn from these da data sets uh, 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 is the following. The, at least these are the things that are relevant for what I want to talk about. So only a small fraction of firms actually export. It's quite common that only 20% of firms in a country engage in foreign trade. In some countries it's less, in some countries it's more, but it, it, it's a fraction. The exporters still typically sell a lot of their output domestically. And in the US, most of the output they sell domestically, and a fraction they export. Exporters are bigger and more productive than non-exporters. They are bigger in terms of revenue, in terms of employment. They are more productive in terms of labor productivity, total uh, factor productivity, whichever measure you take. And they also pay higher wages, typically. I'll come to higher wages uh, in a moment. Now, similar patterns uh, apply to imports. Now, it turns out that it's much harder to analyze imports in this type of rich structure than exports. So I'm going to focus on exports, but I know that Paul Antras next week will talk a lot about the import side. So, so you'll see what happens on the import side, okay? Now the, the other uh, evidence that emerged is that exposure to trade leads the least productive firms to exit. And this has been studied in a number of countries with similar result. And the other point was that trade liberalization, like Mercosur that I talked about, like NAFTA, like other free trade agreements, what they do is they lead to market share reallocation within industries from less productive to more productive firms. And this is actually what Balassa observed when he looked at the formation of the European Customs Union, although he didn't have good measures uh, of the type that we, we now have. OK, so at this point comes Melitz. This is a brilliant paper from 2003. It was his job market paper. So my recommendation to every graduate student is to read it very carefully, because this is the type of paper that you want to write. Okay. It's very elegant. In a way, it's very simple, because the main idea is quite simple. But then it generates a very rich set of results that's consistent with this evidence. So this is uh, uh, something really powerful. OK, so how does Melitz work? So I the idea is the following. Suppose that you are an ent entrepreneur, and you want to enter a market. It's a market for differentiated products. So you have to develop your own variety. You don't want to have something which, which is a perfect substitute to an existing variety. Why is this? Because if you do, you lose all your money. Since you will be a perfect a substitute for somebody else, you will ha have no operating profits, and then you won't be able to cover your entry costs. So you want to do something else. OK. But, say, said Melitz, 
before you enter, you don't know how productive the technology that you de develop will be. If you are lucky, it will be very productive. But you may also be very unlucky. And you'll, f you'll discover a technology that's very costly. So there is this uncertainty about the technology before entry. OK, so now you pay the price of entry. And then ex post, you discover how productive your technology is. And then you have options. You can choose to exit the industry, and you will if you are not uh, able to make operating profits. Or you may decide to serve only the domestic market if this is the best you can do. And in his model, the, other, the last option is you can choose to export. But if you export, you also choose to serve the domestic market because the domestic market, there are no additional fixed costs to serve. And the way we thought about it is that if you are going to export to Japan, you have to make some investment in Japan in order to access the Japanese market. If you want to export to Germany, you have to make some investment in Germany in order to serve the German market. So there are these fixed costs of accessing different uh, markets. OK, so once you do it, then under very mild parameter restrictions, you get something that can be represented by a simple figure. So suppose that phi is the, uh, pr your productivity. If you raise it to the power sigma minus 1, where sigma is the demand elasticity, then you get linear profit functions. This is you know, the power of exponentiality, which you know, the CES basically gives you exponential demand functions. So now, before entry, you know that if you are unlucky, you'll fall somewhere here, low productivity. Then you can't make money at home. You can't make money abroad. You close shop, and your investors lose money, and that's the end of the story. If you are very lucky, you get very high productivity. You say, wow, I can make money at home. I can money, make money from exporting, so I stay in the industry. I sell domestically, and I export. And if I fall in, in between, I make money at home. I lose money if I export, so I don't export. So you get a distribution of firms such that the least productive firms leave the industry. The most productive stay. They serve the domestic market, and they export. And firms in the middle productivity range, they stay, and they serve only the domestic market. So the firms sort based on productivity. And at least theoretically, this is consistent with what we see in the data. So there are different data sets. And they fi you find that firms that serve only the domestic market are less productive on average than firms that also export. If I were to add multinational corporations, then they will be further down here. And they would be the most productive firms uh, in the industry. OK, so we get a theoretical structure that's consistent with some of these features. What are the other things? Can this explain, for example, the, what I presented in the previous slide, that if you have trade liberalization, you kick out thereby the least productive the firms from the industry. They cannot survive the competition following liberalization. And you get market share reallocation towards bigger, more productive firm. The answer is yes. I show you just the figure. You, know, you write down the whole model. It's a general equilibrium model. You do, comp you do comparative statics, and this is what you find. There is trade liberalization. The least productive firms don't survive. Uh, and you get a market share reallocation from here to here. And you get all sorts of additional things that I'm not talking about now. How important are these effects? They are ex extremely important. So I talked already about uh, this point. So let me talk about some data. So there is a free trade agreement between Canada and the US that was signed in 1989. This is pre-NAFTA. This was just Canada and the US. 
it, it didn't include uh, Mexico. And this has been studied extensively by Daniel Treffler, the guy with the missing trade. Uh, he's Canadian, yes, he's uh, at the University of Toronto, and he, it, Canada has, wonderful has had wonderful data all along. Yes, the Bank of Canada has very detailed data, so he used their data. And he showed that this free trade agreement increased manufacturing labor productivity by 4.3% on account of A, namely exit of the least productive firms. This is a big number as far as productivity is concerned. And by 4.1% on account of C, namely market share reallocation from less productive to more productive firms. The latter has been also studied, for example, for Chile uh, uh, by Nina Pavnik from Dartmouth uh, College. And there are a variety of other countries for which uh, this has been studied. So the point here is that the theoretical model predicts qualitative results. And if you go to quantitative assessment, you find this, that these effects are quite substantial. Uh, in this paper, we added horizontal multinational corporations. And the main point there is the following, that in addition to trade costs and economies of scale, which affect multinationality, and one way we, we do it is we measure what we call exports relative to subsidiary sales. Uh, Lil Brainard, who is now the deputy governor of the Federal Reserve System in the US, she, she wrote the path-breaking empirical paper on this. This is how she became a central banker, right? Lil Brainard. She actually was candidate to be the governor of the central bank. And this would have been a much better choice, actually. but. Okay. Huh? Then Jay Powell, yes. But she lost in the competition. Anyway, so she, she wrote a very important paper on exports relative to subsidiary sales and how it, the, it correlates with the degree of economies of scale of firms and the, the trade cost. And if you take a heterogeneous productivity model, this adds a new element, which is the dispersion of productivity within industries. So the model has a very strong prediction that the more dispersed productivity is, the larger will be multinationality in the industry, which means the lower will be exports relative to subsidiary sales. And you can confirm it, at least in the US data, if you access the BEA data, yes, then you can confirm it. No, there is also a marginal well, cost, a marginal of, cost of, of course. Oh, okay. The, I, the marginal cost. Right, that, that, that yeah. Would yes, that. absolutely. Yeah. 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 Okay, so, so here, what happens is that the dispersion of productivity uh, has a bite as to how much you have exports in an industry relative su to subsidiary sales. And uh, econometrically, you find this effect to be very significant. Not only is it significant, but it's of the same order of magnitude as transport cost or economy scale if you use a standardized coefficients to compare across the variables uh, in the regression. 
Okay, uh, Antras, and I had a paper on vertical multinationals. Uh, uh, it has also predictions that has been tested by other people. Uh, uh, Nathan uh, Nam tested this. Uh, uh, then Treffler. I don't have time to talk about it. This is a very interesting paper by Bernard Redding and Schott. It's a theoretical paper where they ex extended Melitz to essentially a two by two by two uh, actual in structure. So you have like the Samuelson model, except that within every sector there is heterogeneity of firms by productivity. So firms enter, they become, find out how productive they are, they decide, they decide whether to export, not export, exit the industry, not exit the industry. So what sort of interesting here? They show there are some assumptions, yes? It's not costless, yes? You have to make some assumptions to get analytical results in this type of framework. They show that when a country opens up to trade, think about two countries. One is capital rich, the other one is labor rich. They open up to trade. And there is a sector which is capital intensive and a sector which is labor intensive. They open up to trade, then in each country, in every sector, average productivity goes up. How does it go up? Exactly according to the Melitz mechanism, the least productive firms get squeezed out. There is market share reallocation from less productive to more productive firms. So average productivity goes up in every sector. Now, they, they start from the assumption that the technology available to these countries is exactly the same, like in the Hexerolin framework. So the only difference between the countries is in factor composition. One has relatively more labor, the other has relatively more capital. But then they show that despite the fact that all sectors become more productive as a result of this Melitz mechanism, what happens is that in every country, the productivity rise is relatively larger in its exporting sector. So if you are capital rich, you are going to export capital intensive product. By this prediction, trade will make productivity higher in your uh, capital intensive sector proportionately more in your than in your labor intensive sector. So why, is I, why have, do I find this interesting? Because you start from an environment in which there is no Ricardian comparative advantage. But if you look ex post at the data, you'll see com uh, Ricardian comparative advantage. In every country, the productivity of the exporting sector is bigger than the productivity of the importing sector compared to the other country. So you get endogenous Ricardian comparative advantage, which is actually driven by Hexerolin type comparative advantage. So this is very interesting, but Unfortunately, nobody did anything with it. Nobody did anything with it, OK? You, you know, nobody took it to the data to test it or anything. So you know, we are talking about 15 years. It has been lying low. But somebody should pick it up. It's really a very nice uh, result. OK, then you can use a very rich type of structure like this to generate a gravity equation. Now, one issue with gravity equations has always been that it was known that the estimates are biased. Why are they biased? Because starting with Tinbergen, they have been always estimated on data with positive trade flows. Now, if you look at, uh, at, the, uh, at detailed data, what you see is that about half of the observations of trade flows are essentially zeros. Namely, a country doesn't export to every other country. And this 
generates immediately, as you can imagine, a selection bias in the estimates. But it's also there is an omitted variable bias because you don't account for the heterogeneity. So you can correct for these two. And you can devise an econometric method that will correct for these two. And if you do it, you find, which is something somewhat surprising, that in fact, the omitted variable bias dominates. So there is a selection bias. You statistically cannot reject it. But it doesn't really bias that much the coefficient. But the omitted variable bias generates a, 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 the biggest bias. OK. Boosters. So Paula Bustos wrote a beautiful dissertation. And she looked at the response of Argentina to Mercuso. And she did this theoretical analysis of the extent to which a firm has an incentive to upgrade its technology in response to trade liberalization. So the question then becomes, who are the firms that are going to upgrade the technology most? Are, the, are these the firms that already export and they expand their exports? Or are there some other firms? And what she, saw, she showed theoretically that the firms that didn't export but were close to the margins of exporting, they have the strongest incentive to invest in technology upgrading. And she showed that this actually happened exactly in Argentina uh, in response to uh, the formation of Mercosur. Uh, I ran to until uh, 3.30. OK. OK, that, there are many other things you can do. One thing that uh, I enjoyed doing was writing this paper where we have, we have developed a model of endogenous growth in which you invest in R&D in order to develop a technology. And again, when you develop a technology, it's a random draw from some distribution. And there is therefore ex post heterogeneity of technologies that manufacture good. But there is also heterogeneity in the research lab, in the efficiency of the uh, research lab. And the final point here is that there is heterogeneity of the skills of workers. And therefore, when you think about an equilibrium, what you have to take into account is, A, which type of workers choose to work in R&D and which choose to work in manufacturing. And then within manufacturing, how do they match with the heterogeneous firms? And the other workers, how do they match with the heterogeneous labs? And when you work out a dynamic model like this with growth, what you can show is that growth leads to more wage inequality uh, in an open economy than in a closed economy. So this gives you some notion of how uh, inno innovation and growth impact uh, wage inequality. But this, again, none of this has been tested so far. So we don't know if these predictions uh, are of any empirical use. OK, the last point about inequality that I want to make now is about between group inequality, which accounts for some additional features. So again, there is a bunch of papers. Paula Bustos has a, a, a paper on this, too. It's, di it's distinct from the one I mentioned before. And the idea here is, I didn't say there is no data. I said it hasn't been empirically tested. I don't know. It hasn't been tested, so we don't know. So the theoretical prediction is that if you open up to trade, then you will grow faster, but you will have more wage inequality. OK? This is the prediction. And there, there are some nuances, because you can open up only in trade, or you may open up in trade and also allow international capital movements. So there are some nuances. But basically, this is what the model predict, predicts. And I, have, I, I haven't seen an empirical test, 
So this is another chapter for maybe your dissertation. Okay. So the so what they did was well. So this paper provides some interesting information about within sector productivity heterogeneity for different countries. And what they point out, and this is the sort of new point that I'm going to push now, is that more productive firms don't have the same composition of workers as less productive firms. In particular, more productive firms employ relatively more skilled workers. So there's a composition bias when you move within the industry from less productive to more productive firms. And they provide evidence on this for Argentina, Chile, and Mexico. In, in the, and there are some other papers, too. So if you do the theory with this additional feature, then tra trade liberalization leads, obviously, the more productive firms into exporting. And we have these two effects, the, l the exit of the least productive firms and market share allocation. But if the more productive firms use relatively more skilled workers, this increases the relative demand for skilled workers. This market share reallocation raises the relative demand for skilled workers. So the question becomes, does this mechanism, ex can, can this mechanism explain more of the inequality that we have seen? than the other mechanisms that we discussed already, or maybe you, know, that you, do, you do it on top of it. And the nice thing about it is that this mechanism is going to work equally in poorer countries and in richer countries. Because the mechanism is that you get an improvement in productivity through market share reallocation, and this raises the relative demand for skilled work. And basically, what it does is that the factor of proportions magnify the inequality in rich countries and moderate inequality in poorer countries. So here's uh, the evidence that's available on this. A very nice paper by Burstein and Fogel. They are both at the UCLA. So what they did was the following. They estimated a model which they calibrated for these years, 2005, 2007. And then they asked the, for, for, the, for, the for following counterfactual question. Suppose that we raise trade costs to infinity so that all these countries move to autarky. And we calculate what happens to wages of skilled and unskilled workers in each one of the countries in their sample. How much wage inequality can we then attribute to market openness, to trade? So they went reverse rather than forward, but you know, it's the same exercise, essentially. So on the left panel, what you see is what happens in these countries to real wages of skilled, the blue dots, and unskilled workers, the red dots. And you see that when you open up more, this is the trade share in these countries. In 2006, the, you start from the bottom. The hike in real wages of the skilled is higher than the real wages of the unskilled. So trade obviously raises inequality here in this sample. Yes. But if you look on globally. OK, so I'll, uh, I'll tell you what we know about. I mean, we know a lot about it. I, I can't give you a long presentation. So just in a few sentences. If we look historically, then what happened is that uh, until pretty late in the 80s, if you looked at the income distribution, 
individual income distribution in the world economy, so that you treat an individual in Kenya the same as an individual in Israel, yes? Then the inequality rises all the time, up to the, about the 80s, OK? Then you can decompose it into how much of the hike in inequality is due to differences in, across countries in income per capita, and how much of it is within countries. And in this time series, the majority of growth in inequality is across countries. So this is the major source. So if you, are, if you live in Kenya, yes, you are doomed in a way, uh, but mostly because Kenya is poor relative to other countries. So, so th this is the data. On the other hand, there is another hand here, very important. If you look at what happens to poverty, so the World Bank measures, they have two measures of poverty, what they call extreme poverty and non-extreme poverty. So extreme poverty is was like one dollar a day uh, measured in purchasing power. I don't remember which year. And they updated. So now I, the updated measure is $1.9 dollar a day. So if you look at how many people, you know, how ma many poor people you have in the world, this number has fallen like a rock. By uh, between 19. 80 and I think 2014 maybe, I don't remember exactly now, it declined by 650 million. People will live in extreme poverty. So in a way, you know, there has been some increase in inequality, but the really poor came out ahead, relatively speaking. OK, I'll stop it here, because we can start now a big argument whether it has anything to do with trade or not. But I'm not going to talk about it. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, but this is, uh, this is a, a really extreme outcome that has never, I mean, has never been anticipated, as far as I know. Yeah, but in the U.S., longevity has declined in, yes. a, in, in recent forever. years. It's not forever, huh? <laughs> it's, it's real. It's a wage divided by the price index. No, they, they, these are wages. Yes. No. no. Well, if you do financial income, it makes it only worse. Because peop poor people have relatively low financial income. Yeah. It, it just will make it worse. This is wages. This is wages. Yeah, I said wages. That's right. So in the... Previous sentence, I, I don't know that there is evidence for it. That the growth is driven by the sales of the high tech sector. But let's leave it, okay? Let's leave it. It's not so simple, but let's leave it. Yeah, I, I can interpret the Israeli data through the lens of this model. Okay. I can do it. Okay. But I shy away from things like this typically, so I, I don't do it. You know, because 
I think we need stronger evidence. But if I have no evidence, yeah, I can interpret it in this way. That's OK, the right panel gives you the change in the, in the relative wages. And because from here, you, you can't see how much, essentially, has the gap in, does the gap rise with exposure to trade. And here you see it. So the only country in which <laughs> the relative wage of the skilled didn't increase is Russia in this, in this data set. But everywhere else, it goes up. And again, the point is, of course, that it goes up substantially, but again, not as much as the relative wages of these groups in the, in the actual data. So uh, this is what the model generates. But it's, n it's not enough to explain the data. Now, I, I want to pause here because there is a very interesting and intriguing issue here. All the studies that I have mentioned so far, they, they take, they are sort of single issue studies. You look at how does actual in affect inequality, uh, how does sorting and matching affect inequality, uh, how does the fact that more productive firms use relatively more skilled workers affect inequality. But the big question that remains open again, this is great for your dissertations, is since all these processes take place at the same time, are there some interactions that can generate bigger effects than just the additive effects that we are talking about here? It's quite possible, right, that there are some interactions uh, which magnify this effect. Now, if, if this is true, then maybe we can explain the data by combining these uh, alternative explanations. But as I said, th at this point, this is a sort of open question. There is no, uh, no clear answer. OK. So the last thing that moves in a different direction as far as inequality is concerned, and I think I'll skip it, really. Uh, I'll do it very fast, is that it turns out that most of wage inequality is what labor economists call, call residual wage inequality. So what does residual wage inequality mean? Typically, when you estimate wage equation, you run what is known as Minzer regr regression. So you regress wages on observed worker characteristics, gender, education, experience, things that you think are relevant for wages. And then there is a residual which you don't explain with observed characteristics. And this residual is big, 70% in Sweden in 2001. In the US, uh, it's also this much. In other countries, it varies, but it's a very lar large residual. So there is the question, wh where does this come from? This became a, a, a big issue in labor economics. For example, David Card started to write papers on what he calls good jobs and bad jobs, which are exactly what I'm going to talk about now. Unaccounted for by observed characteristics. Including education? Yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, including? Yeah. <laughs> Why are you surprised? <laughs> yeah? They don't have, in, in this data set, they don't have option shares. But option shares apply to a very small fraction of the labor force. So it's really not going to change much here. Um, but no, it doesn't count. The, so yeah, for this, uh, for, uh, for the top one, uh, point one percent, yes. So people will look at what what's called labor income, not wages. 
and they, they have access to tax data, they factor in these things. And when you look at uh, graphs the, of the type that say Sayez draws about uh, uh, you know, inequality in the US, they account for uh, non-labor, uh, non they account for like if you, are, if you have a private business, you can attribute it to your wages. If you have uh, shares or options, you can, and you have to report it to tax authorities, it will come in here. But this is, you know, at the very, very top. It doesn't play a big role in, you know, everywhere else. Absolutely. No, because because it's really irrelevant for ninety nine point nine percent of the of, of the war, of the of, of people. Okay, you know, I'll give you a discount. It's not relevant for ninety nine percent of people. Only the top one percent. But uh, uh, we, we know. Not high tech. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But you, you have to put a number on, on job security to do this. So. Yeah. So when 70% is not, is that taken into account? I mean, we can't, we can't explain, even if we could, for instance, this issue with male labor stock. No, so, th so this security. is, so it's really, I mean, these numbers typically come from estimates in the manufacturing sector. And then this is, uh, this is irrelevant. Now, if you do it at the country level, uh, I don't know how much of this will play out. So, so you, you can introduce fixed effects for, say, government employees or things like this. Uh, you often uh, have fixed effects here of some, uh, some other types. Yeah. Life, yeah. And one of the sources of that power was the issue of wage differential. Same industry, same job, but different wages. Okay. So the question is whether you will count it as part of this differential here in the 70%, right? Yeah. Okay. But as I, exp I explained how this number comes about, you do a mean cell regression on observable characteristics. Oh, and also so you this no, so you, you can introduce, as I said, you can estimate it with some fixed effects that speak to the type of employment. But uh, the number in Sweden, I know that doesn't account for it. The numbers for Brazil, which I, I don't think I'll have time to talk about, also don't account for. But these are, in, so th they are really in manufacturing. And uh, they seem to be somewhat less relevant. OK, so the, the point here is that you can estimate uh, firm-specific or establishment-specific uh, fixed effect. And you know what David Card will tell you that if a firm has a high fixed effect, then this is a firm with good jobs. This is where you really want to go to work. But the issue is, what do you, does it mean you want to go to work? The, you have to be admitted. You have to pass uh, some screening. It's not clear uh, what's involved. So uh, I'm going to skip this. So I wanted to talk about this paper that develops a theory that that accounts for uh, this type of wage inequality. 
And the sort of key here is that a more productive firm screens to a higher ability its workers because it pays it to invest more in worker screening. So they get, on average, a better assortment of workers. This generates what's known as a size wage premium, which, is, which has been known in data sets for a long time. Okay? Bigger firms pay higher wages. This has been known a long time. And because of the international trade component, because firms ex uh, select into exporting, it also generates an export wage premium. So there's an ec extra kick that comes from exporting firms. And the fascinating thing about it is that this generates an inverted U-type relationship between wage inequality and the degree of openness of a country. So if a country is very open or very close, they may have very similar wage inequality, but in between, they'll have a much higher degree of wage inequality. OK, so this model has been estimated on matched uh, worker and firm data set. This is Brazilian data. Uh, and I don't have time to talk about it. But to summarize, you can estimate this model precisely. In fact, you can use different estimators, and they all yield similar results. And the estimated model does generate this inverted u shape relationship between trade openness and wage inequality. And it, uh, it helps to explain about 20% of the hike in wage inequality in Brazil uh, following its uh, joining uh, the Mercosur uh, trade agreement. So I, I, I intended to give you a little bit more detail about it, although not all details, but there's uh, really no time. So the last topic I want to discuss is supply chains. You'll get a handful of supply chains presentation uh, in this summer school. But I'm, I want to talk about one particular line of research which uh, at this point is uh, unique. And this is the sort of policy towards supply chains. Because as, as far as I know, uh, Antras, for example, will not talk about this. OK, so supply chain disruptions have become what, uh, what we call the new normal. You read about it in the newspaper all the times. Uh, there was this Japanese earthquake and tsunami in 2011 that disrupted uh, supply chains. There were the Thai floods in the same year the evergreen vessel that blocked the Suez Canal. There, were, there are today shortages of semiconductors. And uh, for this reason, if you order a car, you'll get it next year. Uh, and there was the pandemic with disruption of uh, toilet paper, you know, masks, all sorts of things. But so th these last few are an exception. But the fact of the matter is that disruptions are common all the time, even without the special circumstances that we observe. So me, me, the McKinsey Global Institute surveyed business firms. And they found in the survey that disruptions of one to two weeks occur on average every two years. And disruptions of the order of two to four weeks every, say, three years. And disruptions of more than two months every five years. And this is, has nothing to do with current problems of supply. Moreover, they provided estimates of net earning losses due to these disruptions across different industries. And what they find is that, on average, a company loses 42% of its net earning, its annual earnings, every 10 years. So within a 10-year period, you can expect, according to their estimates, to lose 42% of your annual earnings. 
which is a pretty large number, and of course it's heterogeneous, so there are sectors with larger numbers and sectors with smaller numbers. Okay. But they are not all at the same time, so. No. For each one of them, there is this frequency of uh, the flashing. Yeah, they don't report if they are all at the same time or not. Uh, these disruptions were common shocks to, they were country level or re region level shocks. Yeah, these, we don't know actually, they don't report the details. But all I want to say is that these disruptions are not uncommon, although they are much worse now. Okay, so you can ask the following question. Should the government subsidize diversification of supply chains or maybe subsidize uh, domestic supply chains, what we call onshoring, or maybe offshoring, you know, this uh, doesn't typically arise. And there is a huge policy discussion on this issue these days. For example, President Biden, when he entered the presidency on 20th of January last year, a a two year, weeks later in February, he issued an order to investigate what the US government can do in order to uh, increase the resilience of American supply chains. And there's a task force appointed to it and so on. And the same type of issues are discussed in, in, uh, in Europe. So of course, resilience is a good thing. It brings benefits. But the question is also, uh, Presumably, it's costly. So if I want to acquire a supplier in Israel, it will cost me to establish a relationship. I'll have to, this, we are talking about products which are highly specialized for particular purposes. But if at the same time I want to establish a supplier also in Turkey, then this will cost me too. So it's more costly to have more supply chains of the same type of products. So you have to really do a cost-benefit analysis. Do I want to make this additional investment in order to reduce the risk or not? It's a, it's a sort of, in some, at some levels, it's a standard um, cost-benefit analysis, yes? And of course, the private sector has in, uh, the incentive to do this calculation. So it's not the question uh, whether you want it or not. The question is, is there some gap between what the private sector wants to do and what the government wants to do or what is socially desirable un under some social uh, criteria. So if we uh, take a modeling approach and we construct some uh, competition model with sectors that produce differentiated products and others which don't, then we can identify three types of distortions. There is the consumer surplus distortion, which is well known uh, because when a firm enters the industry, it typically is going to reduce the consumer price index, and this will increase consumer surplus, but this is not profits of the firm. The firm looks only at the profits, so this externality is not uh, taken into account. The other is what in the growth theory we used to call the business stealing effect, which means that when, I, when a firm enters the industry, if it's a differentiated product in the industry, then what it's going to do is going to reduce the demand for products of other firms. So it's going to reduce profits of the other firms. And this is in pecuniary externality, which is uh, referred to as the business stealing effect. And the last one is that there are the markups. If it's a differentiated product industry, then firms charge markups. And then if there are other sectors which have lower markups or non-markups at all, these markups generate a distortion in how resources flow across the sector. There, is, there are too few resources in the sectors with high markups, essentially. So there, are, so there are these three types of distortions that you can think about and that you can try to assess. So think now about a, a two-sector economy uh, one sector produces homogeneous goods and one differentiated product. In the latter sector, with differentiated product, there is a continuum of firms, say of measure one, and they produce non-traded differentiated final products. 
and they engage in monopolistic competition. And there is a competitive homogeneous sector. So there is a distortion between the differentiated sector and uh, the latter. Now, this, every variety needs a customized intermediate input, which is specialized to the particular variety. And you can source it from two countries, say the home country at cost QH, or the foreign country at cost QF. This is the typical situation. It's more costly to source in your own country than in the foreign country. So if you, t uh, if you source in the US, it's more expensive than you source in Indonesia or, or in Taiwan or in, or in Vietnam. And then there is some investment cost K to form a relationship with a supplier. So all of this is very simple. <coughs> and then there is some exogenous probability uh, that 1 minus gamma i, that all supply chains from country i will collapse. OK? So th this is uh, an extreme case. You may think about, you know, Ukraine maybe is a good example now. But m more generally, there are sort of big shocks that are at the country level. And then uh, this probability of survival of a country's supply chain is higher in the home country. So the home country is safer than the foreign country. And then there is some idiosyncratic probability of survival. So this is the relationship between me and the particular supplier that is unrelated to the country level shock. So there are two types of uncertainty here, one idiosyncratic and one country level uncertainty. And the idea here is to ask the question, if you have this type of uncertainty, then you have different states of the world. And, uh, and they differ by what supply uh, links will be available in the different states. And as a result, you get variation across states in the number of products that can be consumed. Because if you can't buy the intermediate inputs, you can't produce the product. OK. So there are some additional things here. I'm going to skip them. But the critical thing here is that every firm has four strategies. A firm can decide to build a supply chain in its own country. This is the home country. This is strategy H here. It can build a supply chain in the foreign country only. So this is another strategy. It can build two supply chains, namely in both countries. This is strategy B. One in the home country, one in the foreign, or it can exit. Okay. So, with some additional details that are needed, you can ask the following question: What is the best policy that the government can pursue in this type of environment, where there is uncertainty as to the viability of supply chains, and the viability of supply chains generates a distribution of available products across the state of the world. Okay, So think about an equilibrium uh, in which all three strategies, uh, strategies H, F, and B, are operative. So this is the expected profit from strategy H. And the government provides potentially a subsidy, Psi H. This is the expected profits from F. This is the subsidy to F. And this is the expected profits from B. And this is the subsidy to B. So you, you have to work hard to calculate these objects. But suppose I'm your research assistant, and I've calculated for you. So you know the functional forms. You can do the analysis, OK? OK, then you can ask the following. Uh, how, what is the unconstrained optimum in this type of environment? So we know that there are markups. And markups are bad because they generate a gap between marginal valuations in the differentiated product sector and the other sectors in the economy. So you want definitely to eliminate the markups. How can you do it? Uh, well, you, uh, the government can provide uh, subsidies to consumers so that the consumer price comes down to the marginal cost. 
Now, in this setup, this is a very complicated policy because the marginal cost is QF if you source from the foreign country, QH if you source from the domestic country. And if you are in a state in which both uh, links are operative, that in this same state, you have to subsidize differentially consumers depending on whether they consume goods that use intermediate inputs from the foreign country or intermediate inputs from the home country. So it's really not a, a reasonable policy to implement. But for analytical purposes, suppose that the government does it. And we want then to see exactly what are the right policies towards the supply chains. OK. I thought that it we run to a quarter to four, no? No, it's at least. Oh, I'm sorry, OK. No, it's OK. It's, uh, no, take a few minutes to wrap up, yeah. if it's possible. Yeah, OK, sorry. I, for some reason, I miscalculated. OK. So what you can show analytically, then this setup, if you take care of the markups, uh, the gap between the incentive of the firms and the incentive of the government that calculates the marginal utility of, of, of these chains is basically negative. So what this means is that you have to subsidize supply chains at home and supply chains abroad, or alternatively tax the diversified supply chain. So this gives you just the opposite from what people intuitively think it should be done. And the reason that this happens is that you can show in this type of environment in which the elasticity of demand rises with price, what's known as Marshall's second law of demand, that there is essentially too, mu the, too much entry, so to speak. And so the, you want to really tax diversification. OK, then the, big, the more interesting question is uh, what happens in the constraint optimum. But instead of doing it, I'll show you a figure, and you'll see how it be behaves. So this will be my last slides, OK? So what this figure, it shows you two cases, one with low elasticity of demand, 1.2, and one with a high elasticity of demand. And in this figure, the benchmark is that there is no variation in the, in the marginal, in the cost of acquiring goods, only in risk. So we look at the variation in risk between the home and foreign country. So what you see at low risk, the number of chains, which are only home chains or only foreign chains, is the same, because they are basically uh, the same. And the number of firms that buy two chains or acquire two chains is here. So now the, uh, the solid curves give you the equilibrium outcomes. And the dashed curves give you the optimal outcomes. So in, in the low elasticity case, you see that there are too many diversified firms relative to what's optimal. And here, uh, at home, you see there are too, li too few chains relative to optimal when the risk is low, but it reverses when the risk is high. And here you see it for the foreign country. So here you can see the optimal policy in these circumstances. So if you are here, what you do is you essentially uh, have to subsidize the single country supply chains or tax the diversified supply chains. And as the risk rises, then you increase the subsidy to the foreign country and reduce the subsidy to the home country, and then eventually you end up taxing it. OK, I, I, I'll stop here. So the point is that the sort of intuitive answer that many people believe in that you should just subsidize diversification is incorrect. And of course, if you have an analytical model, you'll know when, at least 
in principle when to subsidize, when to tax. And uh, this leaves open the question whether empirically we are at the high elasticity case, low elasticity case, which depends on the sector and some other features of the environment. I apologize for running over, but I got confused with the time. Yeah. Absolutely. Which is, so, suppose that supply chains are, are fairly linked, so they, they involve multiple steps, not, not just uh, two. Uh, then, uh, if, I, if I'm a producer, Quite possible. But it turns out that if you try to do it analytically, it's very, very difficult to get a clear conclusion. Even when you have uh, a two layer suppliers, not a long one, just two. But yes, absolutely. In principle, this is relevant. Yeah. Okay, thank you.